Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. That was beautiful. What a powerful message and song, too. And I'm so thankful that God doesn't throw the clay away. Amen. You glad for that? Because we would not still be around that the case. Well, if you need a handout tonight, if you'd raise your hand, just will come and give me one. We have some up here, gentlemen. Thank you so much. You need a handout tonight so you can follow along in the top or the next one in the series, in the top 10 ways to ruin your children. Just hold your hand up there, and the ushers will come and bring one to you. Thank you, Ben, for that. Appreciate your faithfulness here tonight. Being here, hopefully also receive the prayer sheet as well for the church. We pray for those requests and those things. Just keep those hands up. They'll bring you one tonight as we continue along in our series. And then we'll turn again our Bibles to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. And uh, I should tell you this. I'm very excited because yesterday, they might have been Monday, Monday or Tuesday, my day's confused to camp, we got the email that Bridgeport finally approved the parking lot plan. That was good because we had ordered the equipment to arrive, you see the big things out there, so we are go ahead today, I got the permit from the county, and I emailed to myself as well, and then they said they tell me when they process the check, surprisingly enough, as long as we wait, they process the check in like a half a day. It's so weird how that works, right? You know, the, the, the permit application can take a lot of time, but the check is processing it just like that. We got the receipt for that, got everything processed. So we are starting work on that parking lot. The parking lot looks like this coming Monday. So this coming Monday, they're bringing a pulverizer over, and uh, it'll make a whole lot of mess, and we'll be upended and upturned all around here a little bit. But uh, the plan will be, just so you know, and uh, as people become um, uh, maybe not discouraged the right word, but as people get a little frustrated because things are different, all right, they're going to work on that far lane first, and then they'll work on the center lots of the far lane by the gymnasium. They're going to get that kind of laid out first so we can come back in here. So for a little while, and they're still estimating about three weeks' worth of time is it for this project, three weeks. Now, to me, that means it'll probably be about six weeks. Right? But that's okay. We've all done house projects before, so we're going to get mad at them because we've all done that. And men, yeah, not you, Brother Goals, where the rest of us, like, you know, the rest of us, when we start a house project, we're always done early, right? You know, we say one week and it's, you know, two days, we're done. That's what we call the professionals to finish the job for us. Uh, but they're saying three weeks, maybe a little bit longer. I'm guessing about six weeks. Uh, but the church will still be open, just that lot won't be open. And then we'll come down that and we'll park in back of, like back in that lot over there. So some of us will have to walk a little bit further into the building, but it's going to be just a blessing when it's all done. I think honoring to the Lord and pleasing uh, to His sight is something that's excellent here. And I appreciate your faithfulness in giving toward this particular project. And it's great to see the Lord allow us to finally come to fruition to get this thing, uh, the ground broken on that. And I imagine along the way, though, probably some little hiccup along the way, because... I'm involved with the project, and all of my projects have hiccups inside of them. But I'm much planning, but uh, the engineers have done just a great job, a great plan. And if you ever have not seen it and want to see it sometime, catch me. I have it in my office. Not tonight, the church is going to quiet practice. I'd love to show you the full plan. Of course, I had in the lobby for a while, so you had an opportunity to see that. we got a great plan out there, I believe, with some curbage, some nice elements there as well, and uh, changing, changing the dynamic of the parking lot. So when it's all done, it'll, it'll look different out there. It'll traffic flow. Both entrances are going down right now. There's three entrances, but we'll go down to two entrances. Both will be, I believe it's 36, 36 feet wide or three lanes wide. One coming in and a left and a right turn going out of each, each entrance. And uh, just I think real nice curbs, uh, concrete curbs around everywhere except right at the road. So I, I believe uh, we've got a good plan and the engineering team has done a great job. In the process, we're meeting with the, with the contractor last week here, if you must read here. And uh, we had to figure out, they asked me where I want to put a big pile of dirt. Now, a big pile of dirt, um, according to this particular project, is around 6 feet high, 12 to 20 feet wide, and 100 to 200 feet long. That's big pile of dirt. Not like pile of dirt, we're talking mound of dirt. So at first glance, we're going to put it back by the, put a burn back by the, by the bus barn, kind of block some of the view here and there, and, you know, put some grass on it, some trees on it. But then we took a walk over to the soccer field, and the contractor said, he goes, hey, would you ever want to redo your soccer field, elevate it, and make a real nice playing soccer field? He goes, we do it for no extra cost, as long as you seek the grass, we can do that for you. When I first came here, I coached soccer. He asked the wrong guy. No cost except for seating. The level of the field would be elevated and look beautiful. 
Why not? So that's the plan. Uh, they'll come out here for no cost. We'll get that laid out real nice. And, and we'll, it, we, Lord willing, we had another set of goals donated to us this last year. Uh, from the Frankenmuth High School, got rid of them, put some new things in there. I know someone over there, and I asked what they want for them. And they said, you know, they said, J.D., you can have them if you want them. They need some work done. One of them in the church helped me and weld them. So we're going to have two fields out there eventually for very little cost. We'll elevate one field this year. It will probably not be ready to play on this fall. We'll play on the second one. And then when we do the back lot, probably be able to do the, the second field as well. So eventually have that elevated out there in a real nice place in the Lord. Just it's neat to see what the Lord does along the way, the little things God does to show his hand at work. Isn't it? And I'm just excited. I'm looking forward to this thing and, and uh, hearing that pulverizer out there. Just, boy, that, that's things going forward and God's and God's work going forward. So thank you. I don't know if I told you this, but uh, when I was down, one of the times I was down at Bridgeport, they said, Pastor, I um, hope you don't mind. We're sending people down to look at your sign. I don't think I mentioned this at church. Maybe I did. Um, but they said, we're looking at a new sign, and so was maybe the high school. Uh, one other company's looking for a new sign. And they said, we love your sign. That's not my sign. Right? It's not our sign. It's the Lord's sign. We all gave toward this. The community just gave toward that thing. And they said, well, you're going to see strange cars because we're telling everybody you need to go see the sign at First Baptist Church. Praise the Lord for that. And so if you see some strange cars out of that sign, apparently they're looking at it. And uh, boy, that's, that's great because if they stay there long enough, they're going to see a Bible verse. They're going to see service times. And they're going to know right where we're at, right here in Bridgeport. So the Lord's doing some neat things, some great things around here. I'm so thankful to be a part of it. And your faithfulness in that, the financial side, boy, it's just been a blessing to encourage my heart. And uh, we're looking forward to, to this next phase of that parking lot out there. And along the way, like I said, there'll be a little bit of just, you know, just change as we get through it. But we'll, on the back end, be a lot, be a lot, in a lot better shape than that. So, all right, well, let's begin tonight with this in Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4, where the Bible says, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And we are nearing the end of this series on how to ruin your children. Of course, you realize it's tongue in cheek. I hope that these things have been a help to you as we've looked at some of the problems and some application from God's Word inside of it. And I hope that they really, beyond this, many of these principles go beyond just children. Tonight, this will be one of those principles that will absolutely apply inside of a home. But really, it's a lot deeper application. I'll touch on it just briefly, but understand that we could miss something by saying, well, this is just for parents. When we get into this, you understand what I'm saying. But many of these principles are far beyond just moms and dads and sons and daughters. It's really about being a Christian who honors Jesus Christ. And so tonight, if you look, remember these four things. I've started every single one, every single week with these four statements, these four principles. And I will start this week no different. Uh, four things. Number one, very few people are trying to ruin their children. It seems as if some people are. I don't believe they are, but it seems sometimes as if they are. But very few people are trying to ruin their children. Number two, we are all, we are all going to make mistakes. Now that's not just for parents as well. We're all going to make mistakes, right? Yeah. We're, all make, we're all going to make mistakes? Yeah. No, not me, Pastor. Okay, well, good. Well, let me know how you're doing. Number three, we must realize, recognize our incorrect tendencies, actions, and attitudes, and make corrections. Now, that right there is good for anybody in life, not just parents. For anybody in life. If you're on the wrong path, and the Bible shows that to you, get back on the right path. Right? That's one reason we come to church. One reason. So as we hear from God and hear from His Word, we say, oh, wait a second, I better change. Recognize some type of incorrect attitude, action, tendency, and make a correction. Right? Yes. The Bible never says it is enough just to hear the truth. Right? We're always called to action. Yeah. We are called to do something about it. The reality, the reality is we always do something about it. We either accept it and follow it or ignore it and reject it. Anytime the truth is presented, we always do something with it. We always have some response. The Bible teaches us to be, to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Number four, God brings practical truth and help from Scripture to and for our parenting. This book, this book is an incredibly practical book, this Bible. This Bible is helpful. 
There are a lot of old books in the world. There is only one Bible. Amen. There are other helpful books, but there is only one book that is always helpful from the beginning to the end, yes. the Bible. Right. And I'm thankful that the Bible brings practical help to our parenting because I need it. The reality is we all need it. Lord, I thank you for this time and thank you for the minutes that we have. Lord, I pray that you direct my thoughts, Lord, through this, this study. Lord, may you direct our, our time. Lord, help us as parents that we would please and honor you. Lord, we love you. And we pray again for our, our, student, our kids and teenagers and young people at camp, Lord, that you would continue to work in hearts and touch and change them. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Number eight tonight. The top ten weight, number eight. If you want to ruin your kids, number eight, then be different be different in what you say and what you do. If you want to ruin your kids, then just be different in what you say and in what you do. Just don't be consistent. Just be a fraud. Just be a fake. Just be one way at church. With a big Bible and a big smile and a big howdy pastor. And then at home be a first class jerk. And I promise you that your kids will have trouble processing that every single time. I promise that they will not want that type of Christianity. I've said it this way throughout the years. No one wants to drink watered down Kool-Aid. Do you remember when you were young, you went to vacation Bible school? <laughs> Even the old church church members, remember vacation Bible school? Remember that vacation Bible school back when I was young, and some of you are older than me, all right? They mix up these things in the orange drinks. Now, I love it when they buy it from McDonald's, the orange drink, but most churches don't do that. They don't have the money for that, right? So they mix it themselves, and usually it's a couple of ladies in the church who mix up this Kool-Aid mixture for vacation Bible school, grab a cookie, and grab this colored water. <laughs> now, I don't remember the first time that I ever did this, but I remember sometimes, and, and you know, at home, we had Kool-Aid. But at home, my mom seemed to follow the directions for Kool-Aid. Not really difficult, right? I mean, back, back when I was young, right, you still had the little packages. They had this whole display, and if we were really, you know, really good, my mom would let us pick the flavors we wanted. Seven of us kids at different times. That day, there was four or five of us, and she let us pick. And so we grab different flavors that sometimes you have to mix them to make enough, right? You make the gallon, you add the sugar, and add the packages, and have some crazy flavor. But it was pretty good. I loved Kool Aid as a little kid. When you came to vacation Bible school, and you grab this cup, and you're ready to take a sip of wonderful Kool Aid, and you find out that they watered this thing down. And it's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> it's nasty. It's repulsive. I would dare say it is really almost ungodly <laughs> to fool young children like that. And you're talking about causing offense with children in the Bible, Millstone, other things like that. I would think that maybe, just maybe, the Lord had in mind that when he, when he talked about that, about Kool-Aid. These little kids so excited, they take a sip, what is this? Well, no one likes watered down Kool-Aid. And no one likes watered-down Christianity. Yeah. That's not the way that God intended it to be. It's not the way that Jesus, when he saved us, called us to be. He called us to be the same in what we say and what we do. There's some blanks on your paper, some ways that we demonstrate this. Parents, sometimes we expect, we're expecting our children to admit they are wrong when we as parents don't. You want your kids to acknowledge when they're wrong, to acknowledge when they've made a mistake, but mom and dad, are you willing to acknowledge when you're wrong? Or you, do you just maneuver the situation, well, I was just right anyway. We're both right. You know, parents, your kids, are intelligent human beings. They don't always act that way. <laughs> but the Lord gave them a mind just like he gave you a mind. They're not idiots. 
Though sometimes they display those unique qualities that would cause one to think that maybe they're not as smart as you hope them to be. <laughs> if you're not careful, you will begin to trick them that they are inferior. That they can't have any large thoughts, any correct thoughts. It's your way or the highway. Parents who, when they're shown to be wrong, maybe even by their children, say, well, we're both right, when they're clearly not. When we do that, we're being different in what we say versus what we do. Second blank there, or we expect our children to control their anger when we as parents don't control our anger. Anger can destroy a home, yes. destroy children. Remember a time years ago when someone's in my office extremely, extremely angry, extremely angry. As principal, that happened occasionally along the way. All right, just the nature of being principal. Sometimes it was my fault. Sometimes it wasn't my fault. Right? Fair enough. Right? That's the way life works. They were very angry, expressed their anger. They were displaying it in a very loud, vocal way, spit coming out, things like that, right in the face. All right, you gotta get the picture, right? That doesn't always bode well in my life. Does not typically cause me to become angry back. All right, so if you're in my office very, very angry, and I begin to smile, I'm gonna explain what happens in my mind. Don't know why, but someone is extremely angry. Like the situation, I kind of like, it's almost like I'm removed from it. I begin to like notice characteristics about their anger. Uh-oh. Doesn't help the situation, I promise. I promise it does not. Then I have to like bite my cheek or my tongue or my lip because my mind is wandered a little bit while this person is yelling or screaming. And I'm thinking like, wow, they're really upset. <laughs> wow. Wow, look, they're spinning. <laughs> That's amazing. How far can they spit in my mind? Well, it's not a good thing. Not a good thing. But what I mentioned this was the irony of the situation was that they were very upset at their child for getting angry. The irony of the situation, right? Like you're angry because they're angry. And you're upset because they were upset and you're out of control and mad because they were, help me, out of control. And then in my mind, I remember kind of thinking, boy, I see where they learned it. I see where they learned it. And what the parent was saying was not being implemented. What was being modeled was being repeated. Sometimes as parents, we have no control with anger at home, with anger on the road, anger on the road, with anger on outside forces and events. We have to, we can't just expect our kids to control it and us not do the same thing. It's not a say as I, or do as I say, not as I do. Number three, we expect our children, expect our children to control their moods when we as parents don't control our moods. Now parents, have you ever instructed your child to change their attitude? Yes. I have. I have. Now, on a side note, parents, this is just something that, that my wife and I do. I've done this for a long time. Uh, I learned a part of this in college, apart from my parents. I almost always, if I remember correctly, bring my children back to Jesus Christ. Is your attitude pleasing to the Lord? Right? It's typically an easy answer, right? right? Usually if they're getting posed that question, they already know the answer. I already know the answer. Now, I don't want to ask them, do you have a bad attitude? Because of course they do. But the reason to change is not just that they have a bad attitude, but the fact that their attitude doesn't please Jesus. Does your attitude, is your attitude pleasing Jesus Christ? The other day, one of my children was in the spot and I'm talking to, to them. And they begrud begrudgingly said, no. I, I often follow with this question. Well, daughter, son, 
You have a choice to make. Either you can ask the Lord to help you fix it, or Dad can help you fix it. Now, which one do you think they typically choose? Which one would you choose? Right, the Lord. You say, well, Pastor, that's, that's kind of weird. Why would you want them to let the Lord help them fix their attitude? Why don't you jump in there and beat them right then and fix their attitude? All right, because for the rest of their life, they need to learn how to self-correct with the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. Not just me making sure they always do that. Now, I'm in, in, in their path right now. As arrows in the hands of a hunter, right behind a hunter, I'm going to help them direct their steps. But I need to wean them away from me always saying, listen, fix your attitude, fix your attitude, fix your attitude. I want them to begin to identify when their spirit doesn't please the Lord and have them fix it. Right? This is what we're looking for. And sure enough, this child said okay and uh, went a few minutes later they came back in and it was fixed. Years ago, was here even, uh, years ago, I was here at the school, I had a young student, not my child, who was having a particularly hard day. Came down with the principal, and I said, listen, is your attitude pleasing the Lord? All right, they, had, they were not my child, but they were under my care as principal. They said, yes. <laughs> Does not surprise me, right? Does not surprise you, all right? We've done the same thing, parents, have we not? Yeah, I have a good attitude. I said, yes, I said, okay. You think it does? Yes. So why don't you sit here and think about that? A few minutes later, came back. You have to please the Lord? No. I said, okay, all right, listen, I want you to fix it. <sighs> okay. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. They sat there. I said, listen, you let me know when the Lord's helped you fix that attitude. I checked out about 20, 25 minutes later. How's your attitude? Good. <laughs> <laughs> They're not yet. Much pray a little bit longer. About an hour later, an hour, they came and said, Pastor Tom, my attitude's fixed. You could tell by their face it was fixed, right? You could tell the countenance showed. I said, great, great buddy, praise the Lord. So we continued on. Very next day, a four minutes suit was back in my office. Very next day. Is your attitude pleasing the Lord? No, sir. Not any difference from the day before. Equally raunchy, rotten attitude. So listen, I said, well, you, I said, you know the routine. I said, sit there, let me know when it's fixed. I'm not kidding. It wasn't even 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Knocked at my door. Pastor Howell, my attitude's better. I said, what do you need to do? I need to go apologize to my teacher. There you go. I said, there you go, buddy. Go back. Kids can get this. All right. If they're saved, they have the Holy Spirit. He can work in their life like yours and mine. But parents, sometimes we expect our children to fix their attitudes, and we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you let Jesus fix your attitude while I go stomp around the house for an hour. Mm -hmm. It's not right. It's not right, Mom and Dad. Right. Right? Not right, Christian. Right? This is not just a good thing for children. This is a good thing for Christians to let the Lord fix your spirit. We will all have those times when the Lord has to touch us. Yeah. I've told you the story before, but there was a time I don't remember why I was upset. I was frustrated. I was reading my Bible, and I read the first chapter. And my attitude was still not right with God. So I read another chapter, and another chapter, and another chapter. That particular attitude was a 13-chapter problem. Wow. 13 chapters later. You're like, Pastor, you're a, you're a terrible sinner. You're right, I am. All right, 13 chapters. But I'm glad I didn't stop at 11. Yeah. All right, let the Lord touch us. But we can't just expect our children to, to control their moods. We as parents don't. Let's wrong enough time to have a bad attitude. Let the Lord touch you just like you want your children to be. Yes. The next one down, the fourth one down. Sometimes we expect our children... To follow instructions when we as parents don't. Now let me go back to the school situation. I was a principal for 12 years. Very quickly, very quickly, when I was in a problem situation and a parent would come in very quickly, I could usually tell where this child learned this particular problem from. Sometimes you talk to a parent, often you talk to a parent and say, oh, 
I get it. I see where it came from. It makes a whole lot of sense right now. Oh, we'll do things sometimes for open house. You know, BBA open house. I ran some of those meetings. And you'd say instructions like, or like, when we do like the budget vote here, fold the paper a certain way, right? That's a silly thing. Guess what some adults can't learn how to do? Fold paper the right way. That's a silly thing. But we expect our children to follow our silly instructions too, don't we? Of course we do. You know, put your shoes here, your backpack here. You can put your backpack all over the place, right? We expect them to do that, but we're not being consistent when we act one way and say another. The last one here, the fifth one. We expect our children to act spiritually when we as parents don't. Let me just stop here for one moment. Right now, our kids are up at Camp Kobiak. We got preached to, in fact. 747, the high school are probably just about done. Junior should be done a little bit ago. Last night I preached to both sets. During that, we give an invitation to camp. A come forward invitation. We encourage kids to come get right with God. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah. Come, on, come on now, is that a good thing or not? Yeah. Yeah. Amen, it is. It is a good thing. Many of you have your kids up at camp, right? Do you want your kids to get right with God or not? Absolutely. Do you want your kids to make a decision at camp? I hope you do. I hope you don't pray for my three. I pray that God touches their hearts. Boy, I live with them. They need Jesus. Look at their parents. They need Jesus. Not about that. But why would we want our kids to respond to Jesus Christ when parents sometimes we won't? Now, you don't have to come forward to get right with God. I would never preach that you have to come forward to get right with God. But I don't think there's anything wrong with it coming forward to get right with God either. In fact, up at camp, if no one came forward at camp all week, we would not say, boy, that's a successful week. Boy, these kids make tons of decisions right in their seats. Praise God. Every single night, so many decisions, and we could see it, but no one came forward. And I dare say there is no one in this room, save one or two, but I'd probably say no one, who at camp, all right, at camp, if no one came forward any night for any service, would say, well, what a great spiritual week. I dare say most of us would say, well, what's wrong? Would we not? What's wrong? But parents, when was the last time you got right with God? Right? Yep. You say, well, Pastor, it's a long walk to the front. No doubt about it. I come from the back almost every Sunday or Wednesday night. Yep. Long walk. Well, I, I make it in my seat, sure. I'm just saying sometimes we expect our children to act spiritually when we as parents don't. Do you want your kids to read your Bible, to read their Bible every day? I want my kids to spend time with God every single day. Yep. Then parents let us spend time with God every single day. Yep. Do you want your kids to learn how to pray? To pray and, add, and, and pray to God? Then you better be a prayer warrior. Yeah. Do you want your kids to be generous? Guess what you ought to be? Generous. You, know, you want your kids to give to the Lord? Then do that. We want to not have them do just what we say, but what we do. Maybe some deceptive thoughts tonight. Deceptive thoughts. Four deceptive thoughts and a correct response. Here's what happens, parents. Sometimes what happens, we just think the rules apply to everyone else. This is a natural human tendency. What pain sign? Is for everybody else. Road closed sign for every other driver on the street. Bridge closed, not for me, not tonight. It's still open. And I am just as guilty as you are. We've all had the orange barricades, and our we know our stop is right past them. I guarantee, even though this road is closed, I can get there. Until we can't. We have a tendency to believe that the rules apply to everybody else. Number two, we are quick to excuse ourselves and hold everyone else accountable. Yes. Our struggles are real. Others, well, that's no excuse. That's no excuse. Our burdens are heavy. Listen, you need to get over your burdens. But we are quick to excuse ourselves. Well, this is why I did this. This is why I made that mistake. But, but you have no excuse. In that kind of thinking, that scenario, 
then we are doing a do as I say, not as I do. I can excuse myself, but you can't excuse yourself. Number three, we believe that our kids will apply what we say more than imitate what we do. And parents, it is not true. They will hear what you say. They will hear what you say, and they have a memory like an elephant. Just say, hey, if you get done, we'll go get ice cream. They'll remember that, won't they? Yeah. They'll remember that 15 years from now. Remember that time, Dad, that you told us we'd go get ice cream and you didn't do it. They'll remember that like you can't believe it. Now, ask them to go, you know, bring the trash cans in. They, came, they didn't hear what you said at all. All right, no memory at all, but you know, they, they do hear what we say. Yep. In fact, maybe you've heard your kids say things that you said and you didn't like it sometimes. Remember <laughs> when Johnny and James were small, Johnny would sometimes, uh, would sometimes poke James, like, like verbally poke him. I don't know where he got that from. <laughs> I think it's from the rain, but not sure. And uh, we would say, we say, back away, back away. We say, Johnny, back away. Right, that was a back away? Walk away, walk away, thank you, walk away, walk away. So we'd say, Johnny, walk away, Johnny, walk away. It wasn't very long until James, he must have been two, two and a half. Johnny would be burning the phone and we'd hear his little voice. Walk away, Johnny, walk away, Johnny. <laughs> you hear him say these things, where did they, they get that from? Why are they saying that way? Oh, gold. That's where I heard it from. They do hear what we say, but they will imitate more what we do. Yes. What we do. Listen, you want your kids to communicate with you, to talk to you. So they come running out to you after you get home, Dad, it's your day at work. You're tired. Your legs hurt. Maybe your mind's tired. And they're aching to tell you about what happened or show you a picture they drew when they're young. You push them off to the side. You will show them that you don't need to communicate with them. When you try to communicate later on, they won't communicate. They'll imitate what you do and they will shove you off in the same way. They will imitate what we do more than listen to what we say. The fourth one there, deceptive thoughts. We sometimes think that there is a separation between the sacred, the sacred and the secular. If we're not careful, we will believe that, well, there's my church things, and then there's everything else. Secular and sacred. And my friends, we are not saved to have a dual life. Right? My Bible says, whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. But when this happens, people act one way at church and another way at home. They're inconsistent. There's hypocrisy. Now, I'm not talking about putting down wrong spirit. Now, sometimes this has happened, right? Mom and dad will be in a little bit of a discussion, or dad and mom are not feeling well, and, and someone walks up to the vehicle, right? And you don't just verbally vomit over everybody. Right? That's not being a hypocrite. That's controlling your spirit. You're just showing that you can control it, and sometimes you don't choose to control it. All right, but you don't have to say everything you think or feel. The Bible says a fool uttereth all his mind. Yep. But we have heard stories, and maybe you've known people who in church put on one act, but at home completely different. Let me give you briefly, quickly, not the correct response. Some verses there, Galatians 5, 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Listen, friends, parents, Christian, young, old. If we walk in the Spirit, this problem is solved. Yep. If we walk in the Spirit, then we will be genuine. We will be the same. We'll make mistakes for sure. Remember, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. But if we're trying to walk in the Spirit, if we're trying to follow God, then we will do our best with His grace and help to be the same, to, to be this way. 1 Timothy 1.5, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Genuine faith. I am called in my faith to have it have fruits, have fruits in my life. My faith is not just here for church. 
is not just here for my time with God in the morning or afternoon or evening. My faith is supposed to affect every area of my life. So that my faith in Jesus Christ produces in me a different response, a different attitude, different actions. So that someone says, wow, who is your heavenly father? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and not say, boy, you guys did a good job with your children. No, glorify your followers in heaven. It's a point of faith in my life to glorify Jesus Christ, glorify God. Yeah. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus said this, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Quoted from Isaiah the prophet. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not a commandment, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. John deals on those first couple of chapters, first part of or chapter 1 and chapter 2, with being a genuine Christian. That what you say ought to match how you live. Amen. That phrase there, our talk of faith, must be matched with a life of faith. Again, this point is not just for parents, but an application for parents. So in that home, moms and dad, your talk of faith is matched with a life of faith. Yes. But Christian, this is for everybody, right? So at work, your talk of faith, well, I go to First Baptist Church, is matched with a life of faith. So as you go to follow your taxes, your talk of faith is matched with honesty in your taxes, a life of faith. So that as you interact at Walmart and you're tempted to react the wrong way, your talk of faith is matched by a life of faith. So when you're at McDonald's and the person just can't get it right. We had a little situation the night at this way. We tried to order a stop after the, after the, the spring program. Kids did a great job, so we swung through McDonald's, trying to get them some treats, and tried to order some of this. They have some, like, uh, Slurpee almost, right? Like, kind of like a Slurpee, right? And ordered them and, and, and got to the counter, or got to the drive through window, and said, we have different flavors. Okay, we'll choose these. We don't have those either. These, we don't have those either. Which ones do you have? They told us ones they have. We ordered one, they said, we don't have those either. <laughs> Jesus, help me. I'm about to say something I shouldn't say. So I said, okay, which ones do you have? Oh, we have these two. Okay, we'll take those. Okay. As he brought one, he's handed to me. Not, I mean, his mistake, but he didn't want to try to dump that all over my car. After all this, they dumped it. <laughs> Can I have another one? <laughs> but I want my talk of faith to match life of faith. Right? Yes. Not just for parents, for Christians. Let me give you just three blanks here. A couple of them. Number one, that first big blank there, genuine. Be genuine. To be real, authentic. The same inside and outside. That's genuine. Genuine. If you have a genuine, if you have a genuine piece of gold, the outside looks like the inside. If you have a genuine pair of Oakley sunglasses, they're the same outside on the inside. In New York City, you can buy fake Oakleys, Jokeleys, Folkleys, we call them lots of names. They're not genuine. Don't be a fake, a fraud. The same inside, the same outside. The second one, the same all of the time. The same all the time. Be a parent that is real. Parent that is real. If you make a mistake, you made a mistake, kids, blew it. It was a few months back, uh, maybe six, eight months now. It's a Saturday night, and I was cranking. They mentioned this. I'm cranking on the kids. My wife came and said, "Honey, you're cranking on the kids." She was right. So Sunday morning, I apologized to her. Right now, I say that just to say that we all have to learn to apologize. We're going to make mistakes. I could have justified it. All right, they weren't brushing their teeth fast enough. Everyone knows at bedtime, kids can make the shortest task the longest task, you know, to man. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Oh, Dad, I just remembered that I have to. No, no, you don't have to go to bed right now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Right? 
But my wife was right. Holy Spirit touched my heart. Apologize to him. Right? Be a parent that's real. Yes. Be a parent that's real. Number two, that second blank there, not only be genuine, be growing. Be growing. Second Peter 1 gives us a great list of what to add to our faith as we grow in Jesus Christ. The knowledge of Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 1. Write that reference down. Look at it later on. Tremendous list. Talking about adding to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, those things like that. Great. Helps us grow as a Christian. Parents, all Christians, be growing. Be a better Christian today. What we'll place the Lord today than you were yesterday and last week. Until Jesus comes back, we're never finished in our journey of Christ-likeness. Yeah. Last one, last blank, be guided by the Spirit. Sensitive to His voice and to His leading. There's a quote there. D.L. Moody said this, More depends on my walk than my talk. It's D.L. Moody. Yeah. Last phrase, right? I desire to raise my kids by speaking the truth and living the truth in front of that. Still supposed to speak it. Still have an obligation to speak it correctly. But make sure we also live it correctly. Yeah. Hope that was a help to you and uh, help strengthen your life and your, and your children and child rearing as well. Well, ushers, we can not take an offering. If you'd be willing to stand now, we take an offering. Thank you again for being so generous in the projects that we have going on. We do have, I mentioned this before, we do with the commitments from the faith building offering, we do have the necessary funds with those commitments when they come in. They don't offer you enough, enough of the funds with all those commitments to pay for the parking lot. So we'll pay cash for this thing, not borrow any money. It is the finances stay stronger for the church. We'll do more things. There's always something to be done. And uh, just trying to continually make a place that pleases the Lord and further His kingdom. So, men, if you're ready, come forth for the offering tonight. Don't forget that this coming Sunday it begins our mission emphasis. And we'll have Sunday school in here from seventh grade on up. I'm oh, sorry, from first grade on up in the auditorium at uh, 10 o'clock a.m. And we've got the kids will be singing a special song for us. I'll share some of our vision and burden for missions for First Baptist Church. We're looking forward to having the Summers join us from Ghana uh, uh, via Skype on the screens over the sound system. And uh, we're just praying that works just well. And then we'll have some missionaries in the morning. And then at night, we'll have a uh, Q&A time. And this Sunday night, uh, Edgar Fagali, one of our missionaries who's supported for many years, will preach for us uh, Sunday night in church. And then afterwards, we'll go and we'll be able to ask questions. And we're looking forward just to raise the awareness and to raise uh, just our emphasis here at First Baptist Church on missions and outreach in that way. We'll come to the pulse and pray for the offering. Have to go, please.